Good morning. It's time for your weekly lecture, and this one will be nice and short like they always are. Uh, today it's called Patterns of Nation States and Culture in the Atlantic World. Uh, that's a fancy way to say we're going to talk about the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, and the American Revolution, and also something called Enlightened Despots. All right, let's start with the Enlightenment. Now, the beginning of the Enlightenment, it's hard to pinpoint. Nobody just woke up and said, hey, I feel enlightened today. Uh, generally speaking, though, you can put the beginning of the Enlightenment somewhere between 1685, 1686, maybe 1687 with the publication of Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica. And it goes all the way to 715. The death of Louis XIV in France is typically considered the end of the Enlightenment. So we're not looking at a huge long period of time, roughly 50 years or so. Now the main principles of the Enlightenment, uh, you can simplify it into this self-evident ideal, like uh, the pursuit of life, liberty, happiness. Uh, it's about equality, social contracts, uh, democratic republic representation, the building of constitutionalism, and the writing of constitutions. And these beliefs are going to be used to try and change the world. Uh, it's this attempt to change and reform the world in the late 1600s, early 1700s, where social norms and political norms throughout Europe are going to be tested. Now, some of the people that you should know, uh, you got a list of names, and they may be on the midterm. The first one is Denis Diderot. He's a French guy who wrote the first encyclopedia, and it was called Encyclopedia, the Rational Dictionary of the Sciences, Arts, and Crafts, and he wrote it in 1751. It is a book, or a series of books, it's 17 volumes, and what Denny Diderot was trying to do, he's uh, attempting to teach people to think critically and objectively. And in the original encyclopedia, Diderot, he praises science, he praises industrial arts, and then he questions religion and religious faith, and then he's going to openly criticize social institutions and political institutions. You got uh, Montesquieu. He wrote in 1748 a book called The Spirit of the Laws. He's going to advocate for the examination of the Constitution and various constitutional forms. He's going to be the first guy to come up with the idea of checks and balances. He's going to be the first one to come up with the idea that powers should be separated. And then we got uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote in 1762 The Social Contract. And what Rousseau does is he asserts the moral and legal equality of man. Uh, he asserts the sovereignty of the people and the authority of the general will. Basically, the people are what make society, not the rulers. And it's the people who should have the say, not the rulers. And then he also claims that people had lost their natural state of freedom and equality to governments because governments have become so powerful in the late 1600s, early 1700s. Now, the last person is Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations. He writes his book fairly late, 1776. It's technically outside the Enlightenment. And Adam Smith, he's going to challenge the idea of the scarcity of goods. He's going to challenge the idea of the scarcity of resources. And most importantly, he's going to challenge the idea of mercantilism. In mercantilism, there is a set, fixed amount of wealth in the world. It can never grow. Think of a pizza. A pizza, once it's baked, is stuck at one size, and you're trying to get as many slices of that pizza as you can. Adam Smith says, no, that's not how the world works. You can grow wealth. You can create wealth. You can create resources, and then the economy will ever expand. That is what we know today as capitalism. All right, there's a group of people known as enlightened despots. These are going to be rulers who are technically um, absolute monarchs, but they bring in some of these enlightenment ideals like, um, you know, constitutionalism, uh, republicanism, the idea that the people should have a say. And the first one is Frederick the Great. And he is Frederick the Great of Prussia, which today is part of Germany. 
And while he is the ruler of Prussia, he tries to improve the agriculture system in Prussia. He tries to improve business methods. He changes and simplifies the Prussian legal system. And he tries to make the conditions of peasants better. He doesn't want peasants to be dirt poor and at the bottom of the rung anymore. In Austria, uh, we've got a, an enlightened despot named Joseph. Now, he ruled originally with his mother, Maria Theresa. Um, I have her, I mention her because she and Joseph worked together. Maria Theresa, not really an enlightened despot. It's all Joseph. But the two of them, they're going to try and reform the tax system and simplify it in Austria and make it more fair. They're going to try and make a fair judicial system that protects peasants. And they're eventually going to abolish completely the idea of serfdom and peasanthood. Joseph is going to establish freedom of the press. Joseph is going to establish freedom of religion. And Joseph is going to establish uh, literacy programs. Now, ultimately, after Joseph dies, a lot of that goes away. But that doesn't change the fact that he tried. Now, last but not least, in Russia, we have Catherine the Great. I could do an entire lecture on Catherine the Great, but I know you wouldn't listen to it. So I'm going to tell you the basics. Uh, Catherine the Great, she created this new legal system in Russia that was more fair for the middle and upper class. She opened up schools for women and girls for the middle and upper class. And she just generally increased education and literacy opportunities for the upper class. Now, in Russia, if you were lower class, Catherine the Great really didn't care too much about you. But if you're middle class or definitely upper class, Catherine the Great tried to make your life better. So those are the enlightened despots that I think are important for you to know. Now we come to the American Revolution. And let's be honest, you should know all about this. So I'm just going to give you the bare basics. And with the American Revolution, you really have to start with the Seven Years' War that starts in 1750, 1757, 1758. You have this rapid population growth, and you have this rapid economic growth that's going to happen in the middle of the 1700s in the, in the uh, British colonies. And this leads to this pressure to grow beyond the Appalachian Mountains. Now, the land west of the Appalachian Mountains after the Seven Years' War is reserved for Native Americans. There's something called the Proclamation of 1763 that's published and released by the King of England that says, yes, we, we won the Seven Years' War. We got all of this land, but you can't live in it. Now, the reason for this is because if the land west of the Appalachian Mountains was opened officially to settlement, the British government would have to pay to put troops there and to establish governments there, and they really didn't have the money for that because the Seven Years' War was expensive. On top of that, because the Seven Years' War was started in the colonies and became this huge, expensive global war, the American colonists were expected to pay the cost of the war. Well, because of that, protests break out in Britain, protests break out in the colonies about the new taxes. You've got shopkeepers and merchants and printers who organize something called the Sons of Liberty and the Daughters of Liberty. And the purpose of the Sons of Liberty and Daughters of Liberty are to advocate for a boycott of British goods. Now, this boycott of British goods is successful. The Stamp Act, which had been put in place in 1765, is going to be repealed in 1766, but it will be replaced by other acts called the Townsend Acts and the Tea Act. So the colonists are still going to be taxed and taxed and oppressed. Eventually, things get to a tipping point, and the committees of correspondence led by both Sam and John Adams are going to collect a list of grievances, send them to the king. The king is going to roughly say, I don't really care. Eventually, the War of Independence begins in April of 1775. 
uh, the American Revolution did not start in 1776. It starts in 1775. There's fighting in New England before 1776. Things get out of control, and the Second Continental Congress meets in May of 1776 in Philadelphia. Their original goal is to find a peaceful solution, but they also know that may not happen, so they are going to prepare for war on the side. The Second Continental Congress, they send a peace offering to King George. King George says, absolutely not, and so open war happens. The Declaration of Independence is, is made in July of 1776. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, after Declaration of Independence is made in July of 1776, a new government is formed called the Articles of Confederation. And after that, eventually in 1789, we get the U.S. Constitution. And what did the Articles of Confederation and the United States Constitution do? They took all of these ideas from the Enlightenment and put it into a Constitution. That's why we have checks and balances. That's why we have division of power. That's why we have guaranteed rights. That's why we have guaranteed voting. Um, we, the United States government is, in many ways, the lasting experiment and the symbol of the enlightenment I and mean, we are you know almost 250 years later now still being an experiment now the other big revolution of the 1700s is the french revolution and this is one of my favorite topics but i'm going to try and you know keep it pretty pretty small and short for you guys so in the american revolution king louis the 16th is actually going to help the American colonists. Now, it's not because King Louis the Sixteenth liked the idea of constitutionalism or anything like that. He basically wanted to stick it to the British. He wanted revenge. So, King Louis the Sixteenth is going to spend a lot of money on the American Revolution. And it's money he doesn't have because technically France was broke. So, there's going to be a crippling debt and there's going to be a financial crisis. And because of the way the French government was set up, uh, he couldn't solve it. Now, his great-grandfather, Louis XIV, had made money from selling titles and had made money from selling offices. Basically, King Louis XIV got an immediate payment, and it absolved whoever bought the title from paying future taxes. And then, whatever office or title it was that person bought became hereditary, which means the tax revenue that Louis XVI had wasn't there. So by 1788, the French government is out of money, and Louis the 16th and his finance minister, a guy named Jacques Necker, they try to reform the tax system, but he can't. Yes, Louis the 16th was an absolute monarch, but because of the way the system worked, he couldn't actually change the tax laws. So he assembles this group called the Assembly of Notables. And the Assembly of Notables, uh, it, it's not a nationwide assembly. It's just nobles who live in and around Paris. And what Jacques Necker and Louis XVI come up with is actually kind of decent. Single land value tax. Convert the corvée, which was working off your tax debt, into you have to pay taxes. Get rid of internal tariffs, meaning that there will be free trade within France, and then create elected provincial assemblies. These are ideas of the Enlightenment. In fact, the assembly notables liked the ideas, but they said, you know what? We're not the people that need to make this change. You have to go to the Estates General. Now, here's where the real problem is. The Estates General had been abolished in 1614. The Estates General was the French version of Parliament, and because France dove so heavily into the idea of absolute monarchy, the Estates General it hadn't met in a long, long time. In fact, from 1614 to 1789, the French monarchs ran everything on their own. So when it came time to call the Estates General, nobody had any idea how it worked. 
Nobody had any idea what to do. And the first couple of weeks of the meeting were just figuring out what it was. Now, the Estates General, it consisted of three estates. You have the first estate, which was approximately 100,000 Catholic clergy, and the Catholic Church owned somewhere between 5 and 10% of the land. The second estate consisted of about 400,000 nobles, and they controlled about 25% of the land. The third estate comprised about 25 million commoners, and they were pretty much the only ones who paid taxes. So uh, the estates are very top-heavy, so to speak, because the first estate, smallest number, most power. After, be after it became clear that the elected representatives of the third estate wouldn't be listened to, because it was decided that each estate would vote as a block, so the third estate would have exactly one vote, even though there were 25 million of them. The third estate, when they realized they weren't going to be listened to, because the first and second estate were going to gang up on the third estate, the representatives of the third estate walked out of the meeting, they went next door to a tennis court, and they gave the tennis, coat, or tennis court oath, where they vowed they would not surrender, they would not stop meeting, until France had a constitution. Now this tennis court oath, in some ways, is the beginning of the French Revolution. June 20th, 1789. That is the day of the tennis court oath. That is really the beginning of the end for absolutism and Louis XVI. Now Louis XVI tries to work with the Third Estate and it looks like something is going to happen to the positive, but it doesn't. Now, the French Revolution, the, the fighting part, begins on July 14th of 1789. That is the day that the Bastille, which was a prison in Paris, was stormed. And when you look at the French Revolution... Uh, you can break it up into three different parts. You've got the constitutional monarchy period. That goes from 1789 to 1792. And like I said, Louis XVI originally worked with this National Assembly. The noble titles were abolished. Church property was nationalized and then sold to earn money. But uh, by 1792, Louis XVI doesn't want to play nice anymore. He and his wife, Maria Antoinette, are going to attempt to flee to France, to Prussia, because... Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette, think Prussia will help restore the idea of absolute monarchy. Unfortunately for Louis XVI, he's caught at the border. A border guard recognizes him. Uh, Louis XVI, by the way, is dressed in a, in a wig and a dress, and uh, he doesn't have a very uh, feminine voice when he talks. So almost like Scooby-Doo, the, the border guard pulls off the wig, realizes it's the king, puts the king under house arrest and sends him back to Paris. The next part of the French Revolution is radical republicanism, and that is 1792 to 1795. This is where Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, they've been captured attempting to flee. The plan about Prussia helping restore absolute monarchy has gotten out, and the National Assembly declares war on Prussia and Austria because that's where a lot of the arist arist aristocracy, the aristocratic families, have gone. The National Assembly holds elections, renames itself the National Convention, and they single-handedly create a constitution. Then, based on that constitution, they declare the king and queen treasonous, chop off both of their heads, and the government is turned over to a group known as the Committee of Public Safety. Now, the Committee of Public Safety is going to issue in something called the Reign of Terror. It's led by a guy named Maximilien Robespierre. Robespierre is going to challenge everybody's loyalty, so to speak. And by the time the Committee of Public Safety is out of power, and by the time the Reign of Terror is done, more than 30,000 people have had their heads chopped off at the guillotine. Now, it was decided 
that all self-government and all individual liberties would be set aside until France had defeated its enemies. Problem is, the Committee of Public Safety never officially says who all the enemies are or when self-government would return. So basically, we go from a absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy to a dictatorship. Finally, uh, the military consolidation, 1795 to 1799. This is known as the Thermidorian reaction. If you never heard of the word Thermidor, it's okay. It's something we don't use anymore. During the French Revolution, it was decided to completely change the calendar. And one of the months that was created was the month of Thermidor. We know it better as July. The Thermidorian reaction led to the overthrow of the Committee on Public Safety. Uh, basically, even Maximilian Robespierre, the leader of the Reign of Terror, his loyalty got questioned, and he and a guy named Paul Marat, who helped Maximilian Robespierre rule, were arrested, tried, and then beheaded themselves. After Robespierre is beheaded, uh, people are kind of like, wait, what are we doing? Hold on a second. And the Committee on Public Safety is dissolved, and something called the Directory is created. A new constitution is written, a bicameral legislation is created, similar to what we have now, but there's no stability whatsoever. In fact, the Directory has to call in the army to help it maintain power. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's where Napoleon comes in. Napoleon was a well-known general in the army of France and on November 9th 1799 he and his brother launch a coup against the directory and he takes control he names himself the first consul which was by the way the same title Julius Caesar named himself when he took over Rome Napoleon is going to dissolve the National Assembly he appoints a weak Senate that can do only what Napoleon says and by 1804, the people of France vote Napoleon emperor. And eventually, Napoleon is going to be voted emperor for life by the French people. Napoleon, he bars all opposition, he censors the newspapers, he closes newspapers, and he creates a secret police to help suppress the people and any free thought. The other thing Napoleon does is he creates something called the Napoleonic Code. It's this new law code where you can choose your own occupation, you're technically supposed to get equal treatment, you're supposed to have religious freedom, but strikes are outlawed, divorce is outlawed, and the rights of women to have property are taken away. Now, this Napoleonic Code, by the way, it's what a lot of our American laws today and a lot of the laws in Europe are still based on. Napoleon is going to attack basically everywhere. Napoleon is going to try and create this French empire, and he goes to war with all of Europe. At one time, Napoleon is at war with Austria, uh, some of the Italian kingdoms, because Italy's not a thing yet. He's at war with Great Britain. He's at war with um, Prussia, Belgium. He's at war with um, Russia. You name it. Napoleon goes to war. Some of this empire building is successful. Napoleon defeats Prussia and he creates this, this German confederation, which is going to begin the idea of German consolidation, by the way. And he creates this continental system where uh, it's basically free trade in Europe. And um, Napoleon, for a little while, he looks like he's going to do well. But in 1812, in the fall of 1812, he decides to invade Russia. And during the winter of 1812, going into 1813, Napoleon loses over 500,000 troops. He wipes out most of his military. When the countries that were opposing Napoleon realized, wait, he's lost like four-fifths of his army. This is our chance to fight him. A combined army of Great Britain, Prussia, Austria, and Russia are going to challenge Napoleon in October of 1813, which becomes known as the Battle of the Nations. Napoleon loses. He's arrested. And 
he is sent to an island off the coast of France known as Elba. And basically said, sit here and time out. Don't come out of your room. Well, on March 1st of 1815, Napoleon comes out of his room. He finds a boat. He slips out of his prison. He lands on the south coast of, of um, France. And the army that's sent to stop him turns and joins Napoleon. Now, Napoleon is going to be restored to power. Napoleon says, I'm a changed man. I thought about the things I did. And I will be much kinder. I will accept a constitution. I will be peaceful. I believe in the ideas of the Enlightenment now. And Napoleon is going to set himself apart from what he used to be. Problem is, nobody else believes it. Great Britain doesn't believe it. Prussia, Austria, Russia, they don't believe it. And so they decide, once again, we have to take Napoleon out. Now, Napoleon, he knows that he doesn't have a big enough military to hold off all four of these countries. So what Napoleon decides to do is attack first while his enemies are divided. And at the Battle of Waterloo in June 18th of 1815, Napoleon comes very close to victory. It was basically one general, and I'm not even kidding, one general doesn't listen to Napoleon's orders. And that's what cost Napoleon the Battle of Waterloo. In the end, Napoleon is captured a second time, and he is sent to an island off the coast of Brazil, where he dies about, I want to say, 15 years later, of poisoning. Now, what happens after Napoleon is gone? We get something known as the Congress of Vienna. After the defeat of Napoleon, the Quadruple Alliance, as it was called, that's Great Britain, Prussia, Russia, and Austria, they decide to restore Europe to the way it was, almost like the French Revolution never happened. So European monarchies are restored. The ideals and the ideas of the French Revolution are thrown to the side. And this Austrian nobleman named Clemens von Metternich is told to put everything back the way it was. And that meaning where this is done becomes known as the Congress of Vienna. So the maps of Europe are redrawn, a system of alliances is created, and plans to stop any further revolutionary movements is created. In France, the monarchy is restored. We get Louis the 17th. Louis the 17th gets a constitution. Now Louis the 17th is replaced by his brother Charles 10th. Charles X tries to restore absolute rule. He tries to restore absolute monarchy. The French people are having none of it, and he's chased out of town. Eventually, Charles X is replaced by his cousin, this guy named Louis Philippe. And Louis Philippe, for all reality, is a great king. But he is going to be overthrown because of these uh, revolutions that happened in 1848. <coughs> great Britain. Um, after the Congress of Vienna, men demand more voting rights and better working conditions. Now, in Great Britain, there are, these protests lead to a situation known as the Peterloo Massacre. And that's in 1819. Soldiers fire into a crowd of protesters who want better working conditions. Many die. And as a result, the people are going to demand government reforms. Luckily, the king also believes in reforming the government, and it's going to happen in Great Britain. Eventually, the 1832 Reform Act doubles the number of men who can vote. And by 1884, the right to vote had been extended to all male householders. Uh, Italy. Nationalism starts to rise in Italy, and eventually we get the unification of Italy. There's a whole story there that I don't have time to tell you, but uh, Count Cavour, who is the prime minister of a kingdom called Piedmont Sardinia, and King Victor Emmanuel II of Piedmont Sardinia are going to goad Austria into a war. Piedmont Sardinia wins the war against Austria, and they claim territory across northern Italy. 
this freelance guy named Giuseppe Garibaldi is going to form an independent army, go to southern Italy and defeat the kingdom of the two Sicilies. And once Garibaldi has control of southern Italy, he basically gives it to the king of Piedmont Sardinia like a Christmas gift. So Italian unification, it starts in 1848 and it's finished in 1870 when the Pope agrees to give Rome to this new kingdom of Italy. Also in Germany, uh, we got the Holy Roman Empire that's broken up into dozens of independent kingdoms. Austria and Prussia are going to be the main two kingdoms. Eventually we get two separate uh, confederations. You get the Northern Confederation that's known as the Zollverein, and that's led by Prussia. And then you've got the South German Confederation that's run by Austria. Now during the 1850s, Prussia wants to unite Germany, but Austria repeatedly blocks the plans of Kaiser Wilhelm I and his head of state, Otto von Bismarck. But Bismarck and Kaiser Wilhelm find a way to do it anyways. Bismarck is going to uh, use an attempt by Denmark to unify two provinces as a reason to start a war with Austria. <clears throat> Starting a war with Austria uh, stimulates patriotism, and Bismarck and Germany, are, or Prussia, I should say, are going to annex the two provinces of Denmark that we're trying to unify. Then Bismarck uses a crisis over who would become the next Spanish king to start a war with France. Bismarck and the Prussian army defeats France in less than six months. They gain the territory of Alsace and Lorraine, and the German Empire is created in 1871, and it is created, it is declared in the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles in Paris. In other words, the country of Germany, which becomes France's number one rival, is created because France loses a war and it is created in the French palace. It's a real thumb to the eye, so to speak. Okay, last thing I want to show you. I'm pulling over the syllabus and this is this week. So between now and the 11th of, of March, I need you to do Discussion 8 and Chapter 22 quiz. Also, between now and the, well, next week, I should say, is the midterm exam. I'm going to send you out an email about the midterm exam to give you some details, but that will also be due by the 11th of March. And then last but not least, your annotated bibliography is due the 11th of March. So I'm giving you plenty of time to do a lot of work, uh, two weeks, basically. For your annotated bibliography, um, just the most simple way I can put this, each of the sources you gave me for your source evaluation, I now need you to read. So you have to read four to five sources. Then I need you to give me one to two paragraphs about each of your source. And in those one to two paragraphs, what I need you to do is tell me what your source is about and how you can use it in your paper. So once again, annotated bibliography. Take each of those sources you used for your source evaluation, read your source, give me one to two paragraphs telling me what your source is about and how you're going to use it in your paper. Now here's an example of what one looks like. Let me pull this down here. This student was doing a paper on the Salem Witch Trials. They gave me a bibliographic entry that is in Chicago style formatting. And then they gave me information on what the paper was about or what the book was about and how they're going to use it. So this is an example of what I would like you to do. If you don't know Chicago style formatting, that is perfectly fine. That's the point of doing this. But if you'll check Blackboard, click Lessons, there is a folder called Chicago Citation, and that will give you a guide on how to do it. Any questions, just send me an email. I'm happy to help. Between now and the 11th, you've got Discussion 8, Chapter 22, your annotated bibliography, and then next week, 
your midterm exam will open. All right, I appreciate watching. 35 minutes, plenty of time. I don't want you to, you know, fall asleep. So we'll talk to you next time. Appreciate you watching.